Hey everybody, this week on In Her Words, we're so excited for our guest, Tyler Peck. Tyler is a ballet superstar and icon. She's a principal dancer for the New York City Ballet, and over the course of her long career, she's added children's author, choreographer, and so much more to her list of accomplishments. We get to talk to her about her passion for dance and how it started, making ballet more accessible, and her choreographic debut with the New York City Ballet that premieres at the beginning of February. We think you're really going to love this episode. Tyler, I'm very excited about this interview. I'm so excited. I've been like a huge fan. I've been like an Instagram, one of your Instagram fans for years, like big ballet fan. So I'm very excited. So thank you so much for coming on today. Yes. Uh, Thank you. It's so nice to meet you. Well, just diving in, um, you know, why don't we kind of start at the beginning, like how you got into ballet? I know you originally started off on Broadway, Um, you know, where, where did this come from? How did you, how were you inspired as a, as a girl with ballet? My mother was my first dance teacher and owned a dance studio where I'm from, Bakersfield, California. So I was practically like babysat at her studio. And so the minute I could walk, of course, I was up trying to dance. So I say I started dancing at two, but you know, that was as much as like skipping or just trying to be in the back of the room. And She was very smart. Her studio had all types of dance. So I grew up doing jazz, contemporary, lyrical, ballet, hip hop, even gymnastics. And ballet was not my favorite for sure. But she was smart in saying, you know, even if you don't want to go in, you know, specifically ballet, that's where the technique comes from. So in order to do your jazz classes and the ones you love, you also have to do ballet. And so I was like, ugh, okay. But that's that's why now I'm able to be in something like the New York City Ballet. If she had not done that, I would have never been able to to cross over. So it's like I actually um I actually saw I was there for the opening night of the Copeland Dance episodes last year, which was amazing. Um, as well as the times of racing and Justin's because you're not related. Uh, much to much to media's <laughs> dismay, um, but just generally speaking, it's like you're doing so much incredible work. It's like you're an author, a designer, choreographer, actor. Like you have so like you're such a multi hyphenate across the board. It's like where you know what as your journey has kind of evolved over the past few years, what's really been you know what's resonated the most to you. You know what's been you know what in terms of your journey, what have been the biggest lessons you've learned so far? You know, I always like pushing myself like out of my comfort zone. And so obviously dance and my love for dance is my most favorite thing. You know, I don't, I don't really know what life is without having dance somehow in, in my life. And I love the way I feel when I dance, I feel the most, you know, like myself. And with that, that came, you know, sharing my love of dance with children and that's why i wanted to write the children's book and same thing with like designing you know dance wear clothes it's like well i'm in those every single day so who better to know what to fix on those types of clothes that we have to wear than somebody that practically lives in dance clothes so i feel like everything that i sort of push myself into is sort of an extension of of dance. And if it makes sense, I do it. It's not just like I'm trying to uh, attain a bunch of different things. It's just if it happens to make sense and I feel like I could grow as an artist, like that, that is really interesting to me. And that's why, you know, choreographer is on that list because I've choreographed a few things, but I still don't quite feel like a choreographer, you know, to myself. I just love making dances and steps and so yeah that's I feel like I'm still on the beginning of that journey even though now I think I've made works for like six different companies so I guess I am starting to have a little bit of that title but my first one at New York City Ballet is in very soon and that's a really big deal so I'm nervous and excited. Yeah tell us a little bit more about that it's coming in February right your first how yes. did you, uh, how did you, did you ask? Were you asked? Tell us about that journey. No, um, we don't ever, well, I don't think that's how it works, but at the New York City Ballet, you know, you're asked to 
would you like to make a commission? And I was asked, I remember in the summer, I remember where I was, I was in Berlin. And I remember Wendy wanted to FaceTime. Wendy Whalen is one of our associate directors. And she wanted to FaceTime me. And I thought, oh, she's just going to tell me probably I can't go on one of my releases that I put in <laughs> to dance and guest. But it was to ask me if I wanted to choreograph for the New York City Ballet. And I remember just kind of like not saying anything for a bit just because I really wasn't expecting her to ask me at that moment. Not that I wasn't hoping that one day that would, you know, they would ask me, but I just really wasn't expecting it right then. Um, and I was like, yeah, of course, you know. Um, so that's typically how it goes is they, you know, plan out their years and they reach out to the choreographers that they want. And it feels really special to me just because there haven't been that many dancers that are currently still yeah. dancing in the mm -hmm. company that choreograph on the dancers, let alone females, you know? So it feels like a big deal. What, what goes into the choreography? Like how have you, how did you approach that from a creative standpoint? Yeah. Is you it know? collaborative or how, yeah. what, how, well, how does the group, who do you work with? So as a choreographer, it's great. Cause you get to, you know, as a dancer, I'm typically, I've worked with so many choreographers. That's like one of the wonderful things in my career is I've been so fortunate that normally when new choreographers come in, they typically put me in their piece. So I've been in a lot of rooms. I've experienced a lot of, you know, different ways of running the room. And I think that that's really helped me know what I want to do when I'm in front of the room. Um, and I get to pick the cast. I get to pick the music. I get to pick who I want to design the costume. So it's really nice because you get to kind of really get your voice across um, and ideas. And so, yeah, it's definitely been collaborative. I think what's amazing at being in the company is I know the dancers so well. So I know their strengths, I know their weaknesses. And I think probably everybody would say, oh, she'll just maybe choreograph to their strengths. But that's not really all that I did. I felt like this was a time to push the dancers and who better knows what things that they could hopefully work on or, or get better at than somebody who's like in class and rehearsals with them every single day. So yeah, that's the, that's the route I went. <laughs> do you choreograph for yourself? Does I do. It, yeah, I'm, actually, or... I'm actually doing, I don't normally like to, I rather just have somebody choreograph on me, but I'm actually doing something with Hilary Hahn in like a couple days and I choreograph to, two of the pieces that I'll be doing with her. So yes, I do. <laughs> That's amazing. In terms of your journey um, to becoming a principal, um, can you talk a little bit about that, of what your journey looked like and what, you know, what that path really looked like for you in terms of, you know, obviously starting off as a young girl at your mom's studio, but what did that, what did that entail over the course of the, you know, your journey? So I moved to New York when I was 11 to do the Music Man on Broadway. And I did that for a year. And while I did that show, Susan Stroman, who's been a, a big mentor of mine throughout my career, um, you know, she said, it's really easy to lose your technique dancing on Broadway when you're doing the same show every single day. And you're, you know, I was 11 years old and she just thought you should really find somewhere during the day where you're going to keep growing and be pushed. And I had been taking with a former New York City Ballet dancer in California. And she suggested I try School of American Ballet, which is the, the leading school into um, New York City Ballet. And so for Christmas, my father got my mom and me tickets to the New York City Ballet. It's the Nutcracker. It was my first Nutcracker I'd ever seen. And I just was like, wow, like I was blown away. And I said to my dad, daddy, I'm going to dance on that stage someday. And it was ever since then that I was like, this is the route that I want to go and I want to be a ballerina. And so I stayed that year at School of American Ballet. And when the show closed, I wanted to go back to California because I missed my family um, because my grandmother was actually the one who moved with me so that my parents could keep working so that I could live in New York. Um, so my grandmother moved with me. We moved back. 
And um, I, I, the way I stayed in the whole ballet circuit was I came back for three summer courses. Like I didn't go for the year term, but I would come back for the summer. And finally, when I was 14, they said, you know, we'd really like for you to stay now. And I was like, I think I, I think I feel ready. And that means that you live in dormitories with everybody else that's around your age. It's like going to college, but for young people. And it's Wait, really how old were you at this point. I was 14. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And at the end of that year, I got in the company. So I got into the New York City Ballet at 15, which is pretty young, I'd say. I think it, I think it's a rule now that you have to be above 18. But I I got in the company at 15. I think I got in my core contract like six months after that or something. You have a year to get it. But I got a set number of ballets where if you dance nine ballets in the company at that time, it was nine. I think you have to give your you have to give them your core contract. So I got my core contract, got promoted as soloist pretty early, and I th I think in the total it was four years to principal. I know I was principal when I was twenty. Yeah. In terms of in terms of what that looks like, you know, and and what goes into the ballets themselves, it's like what did you, you know, that's very young, like fourteen and fifteen, and then to become a principal at twenty, that's a lot of responsibility. You know, how did you how did you feel about it? You know, were there surprises to it? You know, what were some challenges? Yeah, I think in a weird way, it's almost easier. You know, like how the older you get, the more scared of things you kind of get. You know, I don't know. I remember like loving to go on roller coasters, and now the thought of it, I'm like, mm, I don't know if that's so good for me. <laughs> um, but that's kind of how I feel. Like I got thrown into these things, and at 15, I felt like I could dance anything. You know, anytime anybody asked me anything, it was like, yeah. I could do that. I could do that a million times, you know? And so I was doing what I loved. I had been performing, you know, a lot of ballerinas don't get the chance to perform because that's not really in like the schooling of ballet so much, but here I had been on Broadway. I'd done dance competitions. So I felt really at home being on stage. So I think for me, it was more just the schedule. You know, you're there at the, the theater from like 10 until 10 at night especially when you're in the mm -hmm. corner and you're dancing a lot. So in, I think the hardest thing is just keeping your body healthy. And yeah. overall, you know, my I think I've been in the company like 19 years now or something. But my body has done pretty well, but I have had two major, major injuries. So yeah. in the scheme of 19 years doesn't sound so bad. But of course, when it happens at that moment, it feels like the world is ending. So, you know, I think... I think what we put our bodies through is, is pretty demanding. So, yeah. you, you know, if you don't love it, it's, it's definitely, I don't know if it's worth it, but if you love it, it's so worth it. You had a neck injury, right? Yeah. Yeah. My first injury was when I was like 18 and it was a stress fracture to my lower back and I was out mm -hmm. for like six months. Oh and God. then most recently um, I had a very bad neck injury where like, Every doctor told me I'd never dance again. You know, I might not walk if I keep going. And, you know, it was it was very, very intense. Um, and I was out for about nine to ten months with that one. Uh, but I came back and dancing. I didn't get surgery, which they all told me I had to. So, and it wasn't because I wasn't listening to them. It was just I went to six different doctors. Our, my physical therapist at New York City Ballet was very involved. She went with me to the doctors. And finally, I ended up with one at HSS, um, who I really love. And he was the one that was like, I don't like to operate on my professional athletes unless it's, you know, I have to get you back to a contract like right now. And I said, no, no, no. I want this to be a long-term thing. Like, I just want to be healthy for the rest of my life. So tell me what's best. And we made a plan and it ended up, it ended up getting better enough. I will never have a normal neck, but I have a normal enough one to be safe when I'm dancing. And I just know certain moves that I can't do again. And that was okay to me. I was like, you know, I'm not 15 anymore and I can, you know, my dancing can be different. It can be more, more mature and I don't need to like whip my neck like I used to. So I just have to be kind of a smart dancer in, in how I use it. But other than that, it, it's doing really well. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very mature approach. 
who who was with you with you know when with your first injury and now who's your support system is your is your grandmother i mean your family still with you or how who's your who who's with you during all of this yeah definitely my family i remember with my with my back there's nothing really to do any of a stress fracture you know if you get surgery or this kind of that but my physical therapist was like no 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 you just need rest and so i was like okay i'm going to california that's always what i do go to california and hang out with my family i did it then i did it during covid for nine months um my neck was a little bit different because we didn't quite know like it wasn't like wait this amount of time and it's going to be better you know, I was still in New York because I was going to a bunch of different doctors and we didn't really have a plan. So I couldn't go to California for that. But my mom flew up like I called her. I told her what the doctor said. And the next morning she was there. So I'm very I know I'm very lucky to have the family that I have. We're very close. And um, yeah, my my parents have been supportive since I was obviously yeah. 11 <laughs> and they want to be across the country from your family yeah so and you um you have you've been very vocal about wanting to have dance and ballet especially be more accessible and you know when we were when we were talking about the podcast Renee and I both have um, kids who play sports and have lived through the whole you know you're writing a check for thousands of dollars every season so can you talk about that? I, I mean, I think it's such an important topic and for someone, you know, in it to to see that and, and want that to be something that you're working on. Can you talk about that and why it's important to you? I think growing up, because I didn't love ballet, um, I think I wanted to find a way to kind of invite people in that was easier. Um, and for me, it was like, it's the most, take, you know, it took the most discipline. It was the classical music versus, you know, my jazz dances that were music that I could hear on the radio. And so it just, it was the hardest to kind of be focused at. Mm -hmm. And so that's why like during the pandemic, I was like, there is a way for ballet to be fun when you're doing class, you know? And I started these turning out with Tyler classes. That I gave on Instagram every day for free <laughs> for like nine months. And it was so therapeutic for me. I know it was for so many dancers. I feel like I, what that when I connected the most was people all over the country. Like I mm -hmm. still, whenever I'm traveling, we were in Amsterdam and I was buying an ice cream and somebody that was serving me mm -hmm. ice cream was like telling me how much these classes meant to them. And when I tell you like pretty much everywhere I go, it's not, you know, oh, you're a New York City Valley principal. It's like these classes really touched them because I think it was such a difficult time for everybody. And here they had this one thing during the day to focus on, to get them up and moving. I used different types of music. We would do 80s music one day. I would have a friend of mine like Josh Groban or Jennifer Garner pop on and make these people's day. And you know, I wanted people to be able to dance to live music. So Josh like sang for them live while we danced. And yeah, if I was able to help make it more accessible that way, that was mm -hmm. my goal. You know, mm -hmm. maybe people that tuned in that never liked ballet before would get interested and want to know more. No, they were really fun. And, and we were big Jennifer Garner fans and she was yeah. adorable on uh, with you. And she could really dance. And right? I was kind of when I when I found out that she could really dance, I was like, wait, I remember texting her and I was like, wait, wait, you're like turnout and everything was really, really good. <laughs> and obviously she, she danced growing up, but yeah. Yeah. And she talks about that a lot about, cla uh, you know, classically trained and properly trained dancing, helping her in all of her martial arts and her, you know, her physical scenes. So it, that's what I thought of when you were saying ballet being the base or your mom teaching you that, but that was the first thing that came to mind was her talking about that too. What are your favorite, but like when, you know, when the schedule is being made and the ballet is that, you know, the NYC is, is tapping or the company is tapping for the upcoming season. Are there ones that like you love, like classic ones that you love to dance? Or is everything like 
you know, just because everything obviously has its own spin to it. But just in general, like, are you like, oh, Swan Lake, <laughs> you know, yeah, or is course. it the new stuff? We don't we don't get to do that many full lengths. Um, yeah. We're not like ABT that does many full lengths all year long. Yeah. So when we get to do Sleeping Beauty terrifies me and is glorious. <laughs> so like, when I'm, on the schedule, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the hardest thing I've ever danced. And it's still hard every single time. But it's so rewarding. And to get to play that character, like I love playing characters. And I think that's because of my acting background. So when I get to dance and act together, you know, Romeo yeah. and Juliet, Swan Lake, Capella. So playing Swan Hilda is one of my favorites. You know, it's a really fun role, you know, and I get to, it was my dad's favorite role. And it's it's one of mine too, but it's it's got so much humor. Mm -hmm. I get to be kind of bratty and, you know, so I like playing the characters, but then there's obviously all the balancing ballets that are my favorites, like Tchaikovsky Pata, the Allegro Brilliant, <laughs> Piano Concerto Number no. Two, Theme and Variations. And when I when I say that those are maybe four of the hardest things in our rep, they are, and why they're my favorite, I, I actually don't know why, but I just love dancing them so much. <laughs> why is Sleeping Beauty so hard? I think technically it's the most demanding role. Really. Yeah, I think the steps are really hard. Um, I didn't grow up doing just classical variations, which a lot yeah. of ballerinas did. And so, like, that would be one of their staple, you know, variations that they just did every yeah. single day. Like, I didn't do that. So, in a way, it kind of feels like you're having to do class on stage. And to me, I like when you're moving and dancing. And that's why Balanchine Ballet is with the music. They even though the steps are just as challenging, it doesn't feel that way because it just feels like dancing to me. In terms of, um, you know, your upcoming choreograph, it's like, are there elements that you wanted to make sure were part of it, you know, that you've learned from a classical as well as, you know, mixing, whether it be like the jazz or that, you know, like how did you approach that when you were tapped for it? I think I really, I feel like ballet is getting not a little lost, but just people are giving up on like trying to do classical steps. Mm -hmm. And I feel like all the new choreographers that come um, are more from the contemporary world. Yeah. So they're doing more contemporary movements on us. And it's amazing that we get to do that. But I, I don't think that the art form of classical ballet is Dead. And I do think there is a way to keep it exciting and moving forward. And we are the New York City Valley. We're trained, you know, classically better than so many others. Like, why not use the technique of these dancers like that? Um, so I, that's the route I went. I was like, this is what I do. I know how to be in a point shoe. Half of the choreographers that come now don't use you know, or they use point shoes, but maybe they've never been in them. So let me use it to my strength. Um, so that's, that's the way I went. So you've mentioned, um, you mentioned Amsterdam and you mentioned Berlin. Can you talk a little bit about your travel and do you, how much do you enjoy traveling and where are some of your favorite places that, that this, your, your, your job has taken you? Yeah, I feel very lucky that we, we used to travel more before COVID with the company. Um, now I travel a lot still, but it's more just guesting. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, they're bringing me to to do a gala or this or that. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite place is obviously Paris. Um, I would say I love it anywhere in Italy. I've been to Termina, Siena, Rivello, Rome. Like um, I'm going to Rome in March. So I'm really excited. I haven't been to Rome since well, I guess I was in Bologna last year, but I haven't been to like Rome um, in, in, a, in a while. So I'm excited about that. Um, we get to go to London quite often. We're going to Copenhagen uh, this this summer with the company, which is fun. Uh, so I feel I feel really lucky, like how amazing that I get to see these incredible cities. And it's all because of my work taking me and I get to go dance in these places. So yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I would have traveled the world quite like this had it not been for the ballet. <laughs> How when often you, do you get to guest? Oh, that was so, going to be one of my questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How, yeah. How often do they, are, you, are you allowed to do that? 
So easiest answer is when we're off, right? Because oh. I don't have to ask them. So anytime we're off, that's when I do my like turning out with Tyler and Peck and Friends tour. Um, we went to London, we went to California, and we have more slated. Um, and I get to, I direct that. So I picked the dancers and the cast and I made the pieces. I picked the choreographers that I wanted to, to choreograph the pieces. And we have like a whole, you know, hour and a half show. Um, so those always go on the off time. So I don't have to ask for multiple people's releases. Now, me and my dance partner that are going to Rome, it's during a rehearsal week. So rehearsal weeks are a little bit easier to get releases from. You know, it's not like missing performances. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I've gotten a release during the season when I'm not dancing. It's like, uh, can I go away for a weekend and come back? And they don't love it, but they'll, they'll agree to it if I'm not missing anything that is, is too important. But I guessed a lot. Uh, and, that, and that's amazing because you get to dance with other dancers from different companies, you know, so you're not surrounded by the same New York city ballet dancers. It's like, you know, the best from the Royal ballet, you know, from Paris opera. And that's, that's also a really important growth um, in artistry, I think is to watch other dancers. So I really enjoy getting to, to do those guestings. How do you prep for guesting? Normally it's our rep, you know, so um, yeah. the presenter asks us to do something we're really known for. Normally it's a Balanchine Ballet, like Tchaikovsky Palada that I do all the time. And so okay. honestly, you don't really have to prep because it's kind of like you can do Just it like that. It. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And does, does the New York Ballet, do you bring in guests as well? How into into the company? You don't. Okay. No, I think this year, because it's the 75th anniversary, we have, a few guests coming that they did, but typically that's not something that's, that's not really normal. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. When you work, when you work with um, other choreographers, um, you know, what are some of the best tips and tricks for them to, so as, you know, as a dancer that you would recommend and that you've also learned and you're instilling in terms of how you've choreographed? I hate when dancers or when choreographers waste the dancer's time, you know, like, at New York City Ballet, I feel like the time is so important. You know, these dancers are the best of the best and are working six hours a day. And so to be like standing in a room for three hours and, you know, making up phrases and having them sort of try them and maybe it's going to be in the piece, maybe it's not going to be in the piece. Like, that's just not my way of, of working yeah. um, and not what we're used to. And so... It's not, you know, sometimes I don't know what I'm doing either. It's not that I'm saying that, you know, you need to come in and know every single step. But I just feel like, you know, when somebody's not being needed, like, excuse them. Or maybe if you need an hour to yourself, say like, okay, I think I need to just think on that. Maybe like, I'll see you tomorrow. I just, I, I, I don't, I don't really love that when I'm in the room. So I try really hard not to do that to the, to the dancers. I want them to be excited to come to the rehearsal every day and not think like, Oh my gosh, where this is going to be like another three hours of like standing or of just, you know, finding the movement quality. So I think I could speak for them that I know the definite, I definitely know the body language of dancers, I think, in a studio. And I will say that they seem to be very excited throughout this whole process. And even when I would say, okay, you can mark, you don't need to do it full out. They were still full out. So to me, that means they were having fun. That's awesome. In terms of your designing, you know, and then branching into designing, it's like, you know, what were the challenges there? Like, what did you learn? Because obviously it's a completely different business. <laughs> in terms of how to pull that together. What did you, like, what were the challenges there? What did that look like? When did you make that decision? Well, luckily it wasn't like I was making a company from nothing. So yeah. I didn't really have to do, you know, the business side or know how to sew something together. I yeah. was partnering with, um, so Dansa, which is a very well-established dancewear brand already in the dance world. And so to me, it was just saying, hey, I have these ideas, like, can this be done? I don't know. Can the, these straps be like this, but still work? You know, I don't know how the sewing goes. And so it was really more just me having these ideas of things mm -hmm. that I loved and then them 
making them happen. And I love my So Danza team so much. They're amazing. They are constantly trying to fix problems for dancers, you know, like, well, let's make shorts that don't ride up. So you're not constantly having to like pull them down. And um, yeah, I feel really lucky to be, to be partnered with them. And you're going to continue that work? Yeah, I am. Uh Yeah. We have a new line coming out. I think like this month and I'm already doing a photo shoot in February for like the one after that. So yeah. we're, we're still going. When you look back on your career, obviously you've been, you know, on stage for a very long time. Um, but what, you know, when you look back, what were some of the, you know, faux pas or f- failures or things that had happened that you had to recover from, you know, and how did you get through those? Well, I guess the injuries would be like the top of the yeah. list. That was the most difficult. Um, and then I think it's just like little lulls in your own sort of, I don't know if it's like drive. I mean, it's not that I ever let lost my love for dance, but sometimes, you know, when I got promoted to soloist, it was so exciting, but there were also so many principles that were kind of my height, my like would do my roles that I thought, Oh my gosh, I'm never going to dance, you know, because there's only so many shows in a season. And I remember being really discouraged because I thought like, I don't want to wait five years to do the roles that I am eventually going to do, you know, because these people are retiring anytime soon. Like the two girls that I'm talking about are still in the company, they're principal dancers. So to think about that, I was correct in that. And I remember saying to my director, like, look, these two dancers are not going anywhere anytime soon. We're not that far away in age. I mean, we were, but not far enough that they'd be retiring anytime soon. So can you sort of think of me outside the box and find out where you are going to get me on stage as opposed to being the third cast or fourth cast of these types of roles? And he was so smart and he figured it out. And I, I danced a lot and I think I get to do a lot of different things because of my background. You know, I do the really hard technical ballerina things, but I also do, can do some of the neoclassical things that not a lot of the really hard ballerina technician can, can do. Mm-hmm. So I get to do a variety of things, which I'm really, really grateful for. But I think it's just sometimes, you know, when you're doing the same thing for 19 years is, you know, figuring out how you can still make it interesting for yourself and not get in a rut and continue growing. And a lot of that has to do with your own personal self, like determination, discipline. Like there's not somebody in the company that's looking out for every single person to make sure that they're growing and not doing that, you know, so it's a lot of self-discipline for sure but I have that <laughs> well, it sounds like it's um it was kind of a brave conversation for you to have becoming principal and then asking to really be out of the box because it doesn't it, you know where do you does that come naturally to you to be able to like think of that and like I need to have this conversation versus sitting and waiting because that's for a young person is is unique I don't know. I didn't feel like I was asking for certain roles. Like it wasn't going in there and saying, I want you to cast me in this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. It was like, can you, when you're looking at the season, look and see at things that you might like to see me dance? Because I'm afraid that, you know, I might just be here waiting for a very long time. And so that didn't feel like a super hard conversation to have, but I definitely think the more mature you get, especially because I was going to say dancers, we don't really use our voices a lot. We're kind of told what to do and we do it. But I think having a strong family support and um, growing up the way I did and using my voice acting wise, like I think it does come a little easier to me. Um, I've, I've noticed that and then being in the front of the room, like I don't have trouble running the front of the room where a lot of dancers you know, when they are in the front of it, sometimes it can be quite uncomfortable, you know, and it's like, no, you got got to act like you're in charge, you know, don't, don't sort of apologize. Um, So yeah, I don't know, maybe it hasn't always come easily, but I do find that now it's, it's quite easy for me to 
sort of stand up for what I want. And I think that that came a lot through my last injury and just kind of having to grow up myself as a person because I couldn't dance for nine months. So a lot of it went into like, you know, growing into like, who's Tyler without dance? And what do you want? And are you going to be afraid to ask for those kinds of things? Do you find, you know, obviously we, we follow you on Instagram and so forth and you dance everywhere you go, (laughs) but do you find dancing grounds you like when you're really stressed out or you need to clear your head? Is that something that you, you still turn to, even though that's part of your day job or do you do other things? Yeah, I think I feel best when I'm dancing. There's something about the music and how that expresses how I'm able to express it through my body. Um, And it just, it feels so great. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. Yesterday Mm -hmm. I was looking up a dance and especially if it's like a slower, I've always been, it's funny because I'm, when choreographers come, they always want to make something really fast for me, really hard, really technical. And what I love dancing so much is the more like, lyrical where the music can really move me almost like I don't know yeah I don't know so yesterday when I was making up one of the pieces that I'll be doing with Hilary Hahn it was it was such a slow piece of music that she picked and I just thought god this is amazing I'm in the room by myself getting to listen to her music and I'm just getting to to dance and do what I love and it was on a Sunday you know like of course, I would be in the dance room on a Sunday, which is not normally my day off, but this whole week was a, a week off for us. And there I am in the room dancing. <laughs> what does the schedule really look like in terms of your body? It's like, obviously, dancers have had, you know, a reputation for just like the grueling schedule, what it does to your body and so forth. What does that look? What does that really look like in terms of your day to day? Yeah, we have class at 1030 every day. And it's not mandatory, but that's how we keep our technique up. And also yeah. that's how we warm up for the day. If you have a rehearsal at 12, you're going to either have to rehearse, you know, warm up yourself or have somebody help you. So I always take class and then they can rehearse us 12 to three, four to six, and you can have a show at eight o'clock or seven thirty. Oh, wow. Um, So I don't, I had that schedule for a very large number of years. Um, now I would say I maybe rehearse three hours a day. Um, okay. while I'm choreographing, it's a little harder cause I'll have to like rehearse three hours and then choreograph for the rest of the three hours so that I'm being used the whole six hours. Otherwise, when do I get the time in? That's what's hard about dancing and choreographing yeah. at the same time because normally a choreographer will get those six hours, you know, but I still have to somehow do the pieces. Like when am I going to find time to rehearse the things I'm actually going to dance? So yeah. that's a little harder, but you know, the nights for me are not spent like going out, walking, you know, using my body. They're spent like being at home, taking an Epsom salt bath, elevating my feet, you know, I was making- say, what is your recovery like? Yeah. You know? And that's okay. Like I I I feel like, you know, people when my mom's here, she wants to walk around a lot. And this was the first time I could because it was like our week off, but normally I'm like, no way, these legs are not being used unless it's like for the ballet. <laughs> Oh my goodness. You clearly love, love dance, love everything you're doing and, and growing. Are there any things that you do you know, for downtime? Is there anything that you're watching or reading or that you just really do disconnect? Yeah. Um, I love just watching. We don't really have the TV on much, even though like I have cable still, but the only time I ever watch TV is like at night if I'm watching, you know, a TV show. Um, and lately we were watching oh, what's it called the last kingdom which is actually like a viking show yeah. <laughs> i do like i will say i like cr- crime and drama like those are my favorite things to watch i get really like into <laughs> um and and then you know we'll watch like three episodes or something in one night like okay one more um but yeah i just like laying on the couch uh, with my boyfriend and my dog and just kind of relaxing. Uh, It's been nice to be here. Normally on a week off, I'd be dancing somewhere. uh, So I'd go guest. And I was actually asked to guest in in Florida and we both decided, you know, I think, I think maybe just take the week off since I haven't really stopped since like the summer. Um, 
but yeah. What does your typical season look like in terms of on, you know, in season, out of season, how much you travel, things like, do you get like a month off? Like, do you ever take that time for yourself and, or do you just like find other areas in the world to go and dance? Yeah, that's kind of exactly. We, from the ballet, we get like two weeks in March, two weeks in October, and then basically all of the last half of July and August are off. Mm -hmm. But my August is never really off. I go to the Veil Dance Festival. I've always danced there for two weeks. That's when we travel and we go places like, you know, guesting. Um, I, yeah, I, I, at this point in my career, taking time off, like before it's like, oh, your body needs it. Now it's like the longer I take off, my body doesn't like it. I don't know if it's because I'm used to it and my body needs to move that way. So even though we had this week off on, we waited, like we performed on Sunday and then we started again in class on, on Friday. So it's just, even if it's like a little bar, my body just likes it. Even if we go on vacation, I will, I will sometimes be like, okay, let me just do like a 10 minute bar. Even if it's not a lot, just moving yeah. my hips, my body likes it better now. Used to, I would take the month off, you know, in August when I was younger and the company um, would be off. I just go to California and take it off. But now I think, oh, I'm going to have lots of time to do that when I'm retired, you know, might as well travel and dance while I can. Yeah. Do you find that, you know, you're in, it's like over the past, I want to say like over the past couple of years, it's like, especially during COVID, it's like your influence and everything that you've put together has definitely elevated, I want to say ballet and dance nationally, internationally, you know, you really made a presence and put a spotlight on it. You know, I think, you know, Hollywood kind of goes through its iterations of films, <laughs> shining a light on ballet it's like do you find that you know even like going to I think you said before Amsterdam and somebody who was giving you ice cream you know knew who you were do you find that ballet and dance has become you know as as more people have gotten into contemporary and so forth that it's that it's grown in terms of interest and you know availability over the past few years that people have really started embracing it differently than kind of traditional than traditionally I think yes and no. Like, I definitely think it's in a better place than it was. Um, you know, having like Misty be somebody that's like a, you know, on TV that you can see, you know, it's not, we are professional athletes. And it's really sad that, you know, we aren't like the football players that are working yeah. just as hard in our own way, you know, but that's, because we're artists as opposed to athletes in a way, even though we are professional athletes. So yeah. I do feel like, yes, COVID and me being able to like help connect. I think I was like literally the first person to, to do anything like this. And it was very much by chance. Um, I just, my sister was a principal of a high school. And so she had to go on Zoom in like one day. And so my mom teaches dance for her high school at the time. And they said, you know, wouldn't it be so fun if you just like popped on and you taught the class for fun? And I thought, oh, okay, I'll do that. I'm home, I'm not doing anything. And then I thought, well, I bet you there's a bunch of people. So maybe I should just like try an Instagram live. I'd never done one. And that's kind of how it came. But I did it like March 14th or something, like literally like the first day. And then it yeah. became the thing. Um, so yeah, I think that that helped also make ballet mm -hmm. more accessible mm -hmm. and reach other people. But I still feel like there's a really big way to go. And I, I think that I would love to see it be celebrated as much as some of the other, you know, yeah. sports. Mm -hmm. There's a, my, my background has all been movie theaters and theatrical, and there has been a big movement in the last 10 years of um, televising, you know, Broadway shows after they're running and, and part of that was for approachability and to make it, you know, access to all the rest of the country that doesn't get, you yeah. know, theater and, and ballet is starting, you know, to be a part of that. And, and the, I know, you know, theaters like, you know, B and B theaters and cinema theaters have started televising, um, televising ballets and people love it. It, it really, because it is hard to, you know, and, the, the theater isn't going to, isn't going to change the integrity where it's like, you don't buy a, th you don't buy a ticket and sit in the theater because it's televised on, you know, on ABC on Thursday night, but, but how, you know, through social media and through, 
things like that. How do you bring it to, you know, not only, you know, to people in New York that can't get there, but uh, especially yeah. to the rest of the country that, you know, may not have great programs yeah. like that. And, you know, only so many people can fit in a theater each night. Yeah, exactly. And I always think, you know, it's, it's not every, not everybody can come to New York and see the New York no. Valley. And when we don't tour that much, you know, that's hard. So I try so hard. They make it a little difficult because there's so many rules at the New York City Ballet. And I'm like, you guys, mm -hmm. we got to get with the times. Like, come on, you know. So maybe one day they will they will learn. Yeah, <laughs> but it it, it's, it's a little sense. difficult because, our, you know, our choreography has rights and mm -hmm. crew and all this, these sorts of things. So there's only so much we could do. Yeah. But I try to I try to do my little part and help as way I can. Well, you see it even with, you know, how many over the past five years of like classes, right? Like even like workout classes that are now dance cardio or dance focused, you know, it's, it's definitely changed where you're starting to see yeah. a lot of, you know, women and men who really want to get into it, who want to move their bodies that way versus just sitting on a treadmill for 40 minutes. <laughs> so you're seeing that adoption come through really strongly. So the transition and the, that translation hopefully will continue in terms of, you know, just the entertainment factor and supporting it as one of the leading arts. Yes. Tyler, this has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, I'm like... Me too. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. No, so I can't wait to see you in a couple of weeks. So yeah. we have our tickets and excited about it. I go to the ballet every year. So I'm like, it's something I've always done with my mom since I was a little girl. So I love that. Um, You're in that tradition. It's like that tradition is is definitely there. It's like I lost my mom a couple years, like two or two years ago, but I still continue it with my uh, with my daughter. So I love it so much, um, mm. and I'm so excited to see your new piece. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm I'm excited and nervous. Like I said, you know, of course, <laughs> but more excited. I can say I'm actually more excited than nervous. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very yeah. exciting. Well, thank you. It was so nice meeting you, and thank you nice for taking the time. Both. Yes, yes. Have a good rest of your day. You too. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. To stay up to date with In Her Words, join the conversation by following Women in Entertainment on our social channels and subscribe to our weekly newsletter at womeninentertainment.com.